You are not alone. This is certainly a true statement in biology. While you are breathing, countless microorganisms inhabit every surface of your body. Currently, it is estimated that a human being contains as many body cells as bacteria cells. This means that roughly 30 trillion bacteria live on a human who weighs 70 kilograms or 154 pounds. So I guess you could say we are all people of culture. Nonetheless, we are just starting to understand the impact of those little creatures on our daily lives. Over the last decades, more and more research has focused on the role of this so-called gut microbiome on health and disease. It might be quite astonishing, but we now know that the gut microbiome might prevent or cause infectious diseases, asthma or neurological disorders such as Parkinson's or Alzheimer's. So my name is Kevin Steinig and welcome to today's episode where we'll dive into the fascinating world of the gut microbiome. My gut feeling tells me that you will enjoy this episode. Yeah, second pun. Let's roll the intro. In this episode, we'll exclusively focus on gut bacteria. And just as a side note, there are of course other organisms which live inside us, including fungi and viruses. So shout out to our eukaryotic friends and stuff which we do not consider to be alive. Let's first talk about how we and our healthy microbiome work together. Under normal circumstances, we and the bacteria inside our gut profit from each other's existence. We provide a habit for gut bacteria, and the microbes that reside in us contribute to our metabolism by breaking down nutrients and secreting important metabolites. What is important to note is that a healthy gut has itself an effective barrier which keeps the bacteria from entering the bloodstream. If gut bacteria enter the bloodstream, they would cause an inflammatory response and systemic infection. So as long as bacteria do not penetrate the membrane of the host, they do not inflict any damage. In order to keep the symbiosis, our immune system constantly scans the microbes that are present in our guts in order to guarantee that no harmful organisms are in there. This works by taking up small parts of the bacteria and transporting it through the gut epithelium. Then these compounds are presented to the immune system. In this case, the immune cells mainly recognize potentially harmful bacteria through specific receptors, which we call pattern recognition receptors. These include toll-like receptors and not like receptors, and they normally recognize very conserved proteins on the surface of potentially harmful bacteria. If harmful bacteria enter the gut, the immune system is activated and responds appropriately to prevent systemic infections. Okay, so now we've heard how the healthy gut microbiome is being established. So how did it help us except for breaking down nutrients for us? Well, this is still debated, but a great example is the production of short fatty acids by bacteria which are taken up by the gut epithelium. After having detected these short chain fatty acids, our body cells start to produce peptides which are important for glucose uptake and metabolism. Another metabolite of bacteria called propionate leads to the production of antimicrobial factors by body cells and therefore might serve as an immunoregulator. Moreover, it is speculated that this propionate might also decrease the risk of developing certain types of cancer. Anyway, gut microbiota do also impact other parts of our body. The gut microbiome has roughly the same weight as the human brain. And it might initially sound a bit weird, but the bacteria inside us interact with the brain and vice versa. Since the interplay between gut bacteria and the brain are of unprecedented importance, we also call this the gut microbiota brain axis. Gut microbiota modulate the development and the homeostasis of the brain for neural, immune and circulatory pathways. The brain, on the other hand, can release stress and endocrine factors, which then influence the composition of the bacteria in the gut. So now we come to the crazy part. There have been many studies which have shown a link between certain gut bacteria and the development of neurological disorders. In this video, I want to talk about two neurological diseases, Alzheimer's disease and multiple sclerosis, since we've already covered them in previous episodes and there are a lot of studies out there. Let's talk about multiple sclerosis first. Multiple sclerosis is a neuroinflammatory disease, which we've already covered in this episode here. But briefly, multiple sclerosis is a complex disease in which patients suffer from initially reversible symptoms such as blurred vision, gait instability, or tremor. It is currently hypothesized that immune cells of the brain are activated in MS patients and then start to damage neurons. The gut microbiome, however, might play a role in provoking disease in the first place. In order to understand how bacteria might provoke MS, 
scientists studied mice which are raised in a germ-free environment. As the name suggests, these mice have not been exposed to germs, meaning that they should not possess a gut microbiome. The researchers observed that these sterile mice were highly resistant against developing EAE, an experimental autoimmune disorder which mimics multiple sclerosis. After they've conducted a fecal transplant, however, and yes, this procedure exists and it's also sometimes being conducted in humans, these mice became much more likely in developing EAE. Knowing that, different scientists now try to find out whether the presence of certain bacteria also can cause multiple sclerosis in humans. And therefore, they compared the gut microbiota of multiple sclerosis patients to healthy controls. Here, it was repeatedly found that the relative composition of certain groups of bacteria seemed to be different in multiple sclerosis patients compared to the control group. To be more precise, they found that certain bacteria are more enriched or depleted in multiple sclerosis patients. So this is the first indication that the gut microbiome can increase or decrease the risk of developing multiple sclerosis, and we will talk about that in a minute. But first we come to another very famous neurodegenerative disease, which is the main cause of dementia, Alzheimer's disease. We've already covered possible causes of Alzheimer's disease in this video and talked about possible treatments in this video. And by now you should see that we can approach diseases in many different angles. Last time we were talking about the role of immune cells in provoking the characteristic Alzheimer's plaques and tangles. Now we're focusing on the possible link between Alzheimer's disease and certain bacteria in the oral cavity. In a Swedish twin study, it was found that poor dental status has been associated with early signs of Alzheimer's disease with tooth loss being a major risk factor. In a study investigating over 4,800 residents of a Californian retirement community, dementia was further associated with irregular tooth brushing. Gum infections have also been associated with Alzheimer's disease. So parents, there you go. Now you have a point when you want to convince your children to brush their teeth. Smaller studies have also focused on the abundance of certain biomarkers in the oral cavity, and biomarkers are molecules which predict certain diseases. It is found that the levels of IgG antibodies, which are produced by our adaptive immune system, are elevated in Alzheimer's disease patients. But how can we try to understand this? How can bacteria prevent or cause certain neurological disorders? Well, a bacterial group of species, which is currently extensively investigated, is Akkermansia. To be more precise, different studies have shown a link between the activity of Akkermansia municipilla and the development of neurodegenerative disorders. One study, for example, demonstrated differences in the levels of 25 bacteria between MS patients and normal controls. Within these 25 bacteria, we also find Akkermansia municipilla. And it's not entirely clear how the alterations in these 25 different bacterial species might influence the progression of multiple sclerosis, but we think that they might somehow have an impact on food intake or the effectiveness of drugs. It's also pointed out that molecules which are produced by the bacteria might enter the bloodstream, go through the blood-brain barrier and then activate microglia, the immune system of the brain. Moreover, Akkermansia might also impact the effectiveness of cancer treatments. And yes, you heard right, bacteria might have an impact on cancer treatments. A research group observed that anti-PD treatment, which is a drug we've already covered in this episode here, is more effective if Akkermansia is abundant in the gut. Although we do not know which other groups of bacteria influence the effectiveness of cancer therapies, we know that Akkermansia seems to have a role in this. Whew, we have talked about a lot of different studies in this episode and it just shows us how many research is still going on. Currently, many studies describe slight associations between certain groups of bacteria and certain diseases. However, it is quite difficult to go a step further and investigate to what extent a specific species or a specific compound influences the progression of disease. In the case of neurological disorders, we often have a long latency period, meaning that we do not observe any clinical symptoms. Therefore, we need labor-intensive long-term studies in order to investigate how the gut microbiome changes between a patient showing no symptoms and developing, for example, Alzheimer's disease. 
Moreover, the gut microbiome also naturally changes and diverges between boys and girls, meaning that it becomes even more difficult to find out which bacteria can prevent us from getting certain diseases. And to make it even more complicated, it is heavily debated whether the total amounts of bacteria or the composition of certain bacteria is more important in the development of disease. Other studies have also pointed out that not all bacteria inside our gut are active, meaning that bacterial activity also plays a role in all of this. And because of these reasons, a lot of studies have yet to be conducted in order to understand the precise interplay between the gut microbiome and our body. I hope this video has shown you the complexity, but also the beauty of the gut microbiome. Since this topic is huge, I can make another video if you're interested, so let me know that in the comment section. And don't forget to subscribe if you're new here, and also hit the bell button in order to stay informed about the latest discoveries in life science. And with that, I'll see ya.